It's all about knowing which carbohydrates have the least negative impact on you. Not all carbs are created equal. There are ones that we can eat that don't have much of a negative impact when it comes down to insulin. Now, I have 12 different carbohydrates you can consume, but I've divided them into three categories to make it interesting. Resistant starch carbohydrates, which I'll explain, lower glycemic index carbohydrates, and then a very unique subcategory of carbohydrates that have enzyme inhibitors. So when you consume them, they have kind of naturally occurring inhibitors that make it so that the enzymes don't actually break them down to begin with. So you get to have your cake and eat it too. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's break it down. Now, what also is important with all of this is carbohydrates are going to have less impact no matter what when they are consumed with protein. Okay, so just remember that. That is one of the most important things that you can note. So whether you're doing a lower carb protocol or not, consuming carbohydrates alongside protein is going to make it so you're not getting as crazy of an insulin to glucagon ratio breakout. So basically, it's making it so that the insulin spike that you get from carbohydrates is at least negated a little bit by the protein slowing down the absorption. Uh, the protein that I recommend, the sponsor of today's video, is one called Sun Warrior, and it's a warrior blend. So it is a pea and hemp blend. I use it when I'm breaking my intermittent fast. I use it when I'm doing low carb. I use it when I'm doing plant-based experiments, all kinds of stuff. It's my go-to protein, and there's a link down below that will save you 20% off a tub of Sun Warriors Pea and Hemp Protein Warrior Blend. It is amazing. The mocha flavor, totally my jam. It is by far my favorite one, but they also have berry, chocolate, and vanilla. So anyhow, that link is down below. A big thank you to Sun Warrior for the continued support on this channel. So if you're looking for a good protein powder to use post-workout or as a meal replacement, check them out down below and save 20% using that link. Okay, let's start with resistant starches. Resistant starches are carbohydrates that are resistant to the enzymatic breakdown, usually because of the molecular structure. Okay, let me explain how this really works. Basically, you have these kinds of starches that do not break down in the gut, but what they do is they pass all the way through into the gut into the small intestine and then into the large intestine where your body doesn't absorb them, but your microbiome, the bacteria within your gut, eats them. So they're resistant to digestion, but they actually benefit the microbiome because they're the only little suckers that can actually consume it. It's pretty fascinating. So there's four classes of resistant starch. There's RS1. RS1 resistant starch are things that have really structured cell walls, okay? Like uh, different kinds of seeds and some kinds of grains that have a hard hull where you literally don't digest them at all and they pass through your gut almost as the way they went in, okay? Then you have RS2, which are resistant starches because of the molecular setup of them. So an example of these are gonna be things like uh, green banana flour or plantains, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second about. Uh, also raw potatoes, potatoes that are cold. So what ends up happening there is they bypass digestion because they're resistant to our own digestion, but then they do a glorious job of feeding the gut microbiome. Again, I'll talk about that in a second. Then we have RS3, also known as retrograded starch. These are starches like potatoes that are heated and then cooled because once they get hot and then get cooled again, the starch molecules change and they become a different kind of resistant starch, which is similar, but it's just a retrograded form. Don't need to go into detail there. Then finally, RS4, it's like man-made, like uh, polydextrins, things like that, which again, resistant dextrin, don't need to go into the details there. So what does this actually do? Okay. In addition to not digesting and being carbohydrates that you can consume that do not have a negative impact on your insulin levels, they also benefit your gut microbiome tremendously because what happens is they break down into short chain fatty acids like butyrate. Now there's a study that was published in the journal Nutrition Bulletin that found that just that, that when you consumed resistant starch, it broke down into butyrate once the microbiome started feeding on it. So these short chain fatty acids like butyrate have tremendous effects. They are inflammatory modulators, meaning that they can actually inhibit nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, they also have what are called histone deacetylase inhibition effects. Bottom line is they act a lot like ketones do in the body. They allow us to express more genes. They allow us to activate more brown fat. There was a study that was published in the journal Gut Microbiota that showed that butyrate actually allowed us to activate more brown fat, meaning we were burning more fat via body heat. So again, what that simply means is we're getting all these secondary benefits, other videos explaining that. So what kind of foods are we talking about here though? Okay, we're talking about gluten-free cooled oats. So if you were to cook some oats and then let them get cold, 
Believe it or not, those become an RS3 starch that you have a very little insulin spike from. Doesn't mean that you need to go consume a bunch of them, but that's a perfect one there. Then we have cooled rice, like sushi rice that doesn't have the sugar added to it. Again, you could have a small amount of that and it would be perfect. Then we have plantains that are somewhat unripe. So like halfway to being ripe plantains, same kind of thing with like green bananas, same category. Another thing that sounds kind of funny, but if you go to a deli and you see like those cold bean salads, like lima bean salads and you know pinto bean salads that are cold, well, you have a high degree of resistant starch there. And I know it's not the most glamorous food in the world, but if you're looking to have some carbohydrates that you maybe want to combine with some other carbs, well, that's going to lessen the impact. So it's definitely a good one. Cassava. There's a lot of cassava chips on the market, like Siete brand makes some really good ones, right? Also tiger nut flour. So if you're baking or you're breading chicken, things like that, use cassava flour, use tiger nut. They are resistant starches that go towards butyrate formation, which can also help us out with insulin resistance. There's a lot of studies that demonstrate that as well. There's a study that was published in the journal Nutrition that found that when obese subjects were fed RS2 starches, it increased levels of glucagon-like peptide 1, which has a positive effect on insulin resistance, meaning it was able to actually trigger a positive outcome and start modulating that so there is an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So there's a longer outcome by consuming resistant starches as well. Anyway, let's move into the next category. The next category is going to be the lower glycemic index carbohydrates. Now, some of these aren't as like flabbergasting, right? Because we know what the glycemic index is. But what we do have to factor in is that the less that we spike our insulin with a low glycemic carbohydrate, the better that we can keep, again, that insulin to glucagon ratio, keeping us in that fat burning stage, or if you're doing ketosis, that ketone formation stage a bit more. So what I would recommend there is gonna be things like grapefruit, Realistically, you could have a couple of grapefruits a day even if you're doing ketosis. It's really not going to do a whole lot of damage to you. Then we have raspberries, which definitely makes the low glycemic category, but also has an amylase inhibitor, meaning it slows down the absorption of the carbohydrates within the raspberry to begin with. Then we have psyllium, which I know isn't the, you know, again, the coolest sounding thing, but you can bake with psyllium. Okay, it is a fiber, but it's also a carbohydrate, and it's so low glycemic, it practically has no effect on your insulin levels at all. It's really awesome. And then another one that I like to utilize are lentils, okay? Like red split lentils and green split lentils are super low glycemic. And especially if you heat them and then cool them and let them cool a little bit and they become a little bit more of a resistant starch on top of it. Okay, so definitely something that you can have that's gonna have very little impact. You could realistically have a small amount of them on ketosis and it wouldn't really bother you all that much. The next category of foods are really interesting. These are ones that contain enzyme inhibitors. So you see how I've divided this into three categories. We've got resistant starch, low glycemic, and now we're in a specific subcategory that has enzyme inhibitors that make it so that the enzymes can't really do their job. So when we consume carbohydrates, our saliva starts to break it down, okay? Then it travels down, it goes into our stomach where it mixes with acid and chyme and all this, and it starts to kind of like break it down more. Then it goes into the intestine and it reacts with pancreatic amylase and it breaks it down into dextrin, breaks it down into maltose, these smaller particles, which further get broken down even more. So there's all these different enzymatic interactions with carbohydrates that we eat. And if at any one point in time we can step in, interrupt one of those enzymatic responses and breakdowns, we can actually inhibit some of the absorption of the carbohydrates, making the molecules too big to actually absorb. It's really fascinating. So one of the most prevalent ones that are out there in terms of amylase inhibitors are going to be beans, flat out. Okay, lima beans are great with them, soybeans are great with them, but with soybeans make sure you're getting organic non-GMO. Here's the thing with beans. Once you heat them, it does sort of break down the amylase inhibition effect, so it lessens. So you do want to eat beans cold, which is kind of weird, but in the world of soybeans and edamame, things like that, that is a perfect one. Like edamame is in a lot of ways almost a free food. Like you don't get a lot of the carbohydrate impact from the edamame there. Then we come back to the raspberries again. The interesting thing about raspberries is raspberries also have the amylase inhibitor on top of being low glycemic. I've talked about them, done specific videos on them, how they are a fruit that is practically good to go on keto. You could really eat a half a cup of them and not have too much of a problem. Then there's a different category of enzymes called glucosidases, and we want to inhibit those. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry that found that red cabbage contained a specific kind of glucosidase inhibitor. So does that mean that red cabbage is a carbohydrate you want to chow down on? I mean, no, I'm not suggesting that. But if you wanted to make a coleslaw, 
you can definitely add some red cabbage into it. But one of the reasons that I mentioned this is I did a video a while back where I made some cassava tacos, right? I used cassava shells, which were already low glycemic and also resistant starch. I breaded chicken in cassava. And then what did I put on the actual taco? red cabbage. So it's sort of a thing that you can add to carbohydrates because it's going to offer an additional enzyme inhibitor. So basically you're coming in from a different direction, lessening the impact of the carbohydrate. So adding red cabbage to your dishes that have some carbohydrates can make it so they're a little less negatively impactful. Okay, so just to recap, we have the resistant starches where we have things like cold oats, okay? Small amounts of that. Cold sushi rice that doesn't have the sugar. Green plantains, green bananas cold bean salads, cassava, tiger nut flour, okay? Then we have things like grapefruit, we have raspberries, we have psyllium, we have lentils within the low glycemic category. Then in the enzyme inhibitor category, we have cold beans, we have soybeans like edamame, we have raspberries once again, and then we have red cabbage in that different category. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of some wiggle room to have some fun with some carbohydrates. Sorry I couldn't tell you that you can eat a bunch of cake, but at least it gets you across the goal line a little bit. I'll see you tomorrow.